This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 275, recorded on October 13th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Charleston, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. Who weathered the storm, right, Michael? You okay? I- I did indeed weather the storm, lost some siding off the side of the house. It it was a wind tunnel effect and wonderful contractors use steel nails and they failed after 15 years and (laughs) and they rusted out because I live on the coast. And remember, galvanized is your friend. (laughs) <laughs> but you you fared much better than Florida. They oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I am not complaining. I am not complaining. Also joining us from St. Louis, Petra Levin. Hello. We Did have you get no- any storms from uh, the hurricane? Not no? really. We got, we've gotten a little rain, but I think it's just kind of random and coming from the west, not the so south. We had like five days of rain continuous from Saturday to the next week because of this, the remnants, Ian. you know. The yeah, remnants yeah, no, we've been. Here having a really beautiful fall. It hasn't been hot. It's been really crisp. It makes you feel like you're in New England right now. So I thought it was funny that the hurricane is named Ian because, you know, my colleague is Ian Lipkin. <laughs> and sometimes he could be a hurricane <laughs> in a good way. But well, he that's is not good. listening, so it's okay. All right. Today we have, as usual, two papers for your consumption. And uh, we'll start off with a snippet from Petra. So this paper is entitled High Rates of Plasmid Co-Transformation in E. coli Overturn the Clonality Myth and Reveal Colony Development. It was published in Scientific Reports, and it is by Delia Tomiaga, Jacqueline Bubnell, Liam Herndon, and Paul Feinstein at Hunter College. And this paper is amazing for many reasons. First of all, it's just gorgeous. So I encourage all the listeners to pull this paper up and just look at the figures. Some of the colony imaging they have looks like these Venetian or Italian marbled paper that's sometimes Mm -hmm. in the front of books. It's so beautiful. So that's one thing. Second thing is this paper. It really shows the importance actually of diverse thinking, I think, in biology um, because Dr. Feinstein actually works on stem cells and stem cell development and is not a microbiologist, but he is a very curious person. And Mm. the students in his lab, including a high school student, were also very curious about some of their results. And they did these beautiful experiments that I'm going to tell you guys about. But there are three things, I think, three big take-home messages from this paper that I think are very important. First of all, it's that one of the surprises or at least a surprise to those of us who use E. coli most for cloning, is that E. coli cells, despite what we're told in intro micro, can harbor multiple plasmids at the same time. So normally when you clone in E. coli, you take a plasmid and you put a piece of DNA into it, or maybe now you synthesize it in a different way and you transform that plasmid into E. coli cells, and you plate them selecting for the drug resistance on the plasmid, and you get single colonies. And we're always told to streak those colonies out for more single colonies, just in case they're two colonies close together. But what this paper finds using really beautiful imaging with fluorescent proteins is that the colonies can, these individual cells can actually harbor multiple plasmids in them at the same time. The other big take-home message before I get into the details is that within the colonies, you can get mosaics. So if you can have one cell harboring multiple plasmids, they could also lose one of those plasmids. So you can have in a colony, say the transformation had three different plasmids and they, again, tend, they use different colored fluorescent proteins. You could have a, pla- a cell, some cells that contain all three, some that might just contain two, some that contain one, some that contain a different set of two. So the colonies can be mosaic. And then the third point, which I'll go over in a little more detail, is they took advantage of these fluorescent 
proteins to be able to watch colonies develop. And they have super bright fusion, so they can see single cells, even using, as uh, Dr. Feinstein noted, a not ideal microscope for looking at single bacterial <laughs> cells and some heroic work by one of the students. You can see the colony develop. And what's really important, and I'm actually surprised nobody's actually looked at this, is if you watch the colony develop from a single cell, um, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, colonies tend to form or people think they form in these concentric circles. And we talked about this paper a couple weeks ago about light and redox and using tetrazoleum to see colony development. And they those colonies have concentric circles. And that's actually a lot of times if you have an older colony, you can even see it just on a plate, these concentric circles. But when they looked with at the single cells, they can see the colonies develop Actually, the, the single cells kind of grow and you get like a micro colony that's a kind of irregular shape. And then the bigger the colony gets, you can get uh, eventually something that's round. So mm -hmm. they're very much not forming in concentric circles. And again, using these fluorescent markers, they can show that even though you can see physical concentric circles on the older colonies, when you look at the fluorescence, the fluorescence is not at all uniform in those concentric circles. So there seems to be something very interesting going on with colony development that's actually been overlooked for many years. So, And the, the cool thing that I think this paper brings out is they sort of limit the bias because by using three similar fluorescent proteins, you could argue or hand wave, depending upon how strong you want to make it, that you're not going to impose a fitness penalty because you could understand how you could get plasmid exclusion oh, if one of, the, one of the proteins would impose a fitness penalty on the microbe that would be harboring it because they all still have the same or different selectable markers. So you're still forcing the cell to maintain the plasma, but if it imposes too great of a fitness penalty, the cell is going to pitch it. Right. So exactly. So now I'm, I'm now that I've kind of given you the take home message, I just wanted to start from the beginning. And so Dr. Feinstein, again, is a eukaryotic cell biologist. He works with large cells, uh, can I, can I tell you? Can I yep. tell you about Paul? I know Paul. He got his PhD at Columbia, ah. right? And I remember him as a young guy. And then um, I used to teach at Hunter uh, one lecture a year, and I used to see him, and he always used to say hello because he knew me from Columbia. Then this year, I taught in in one of his courses. He's actually a neurobiologist interested exactly. in olfaction. Right, and, he's interested in something completely unrelated to and, E. coli. You know, he probably. was he was very interested in uh, in COVID. You know, one olfaction, of, uh, olfaction, yeah. right? Exactly. So he got in. In, in fact, I'm going to have him on one of my other podcasts this week in neuroscience to talk about that. So I know Paul. Hello, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> very cool work. And as you said, Petra, it's so cool. You know, they're just using plasmids as tools to shuffle genes around, and they notice right. something and, and they followed it up. It's great. Exactly. So, I mean, it basically started from the observation that when he was doing his work on olfaction, they were trying to clone large stretches of DNA into E. coli so that they could then put them into stem cells to use as kind of a landing pad for other things. And when they did this, they noticed they often were, even though they'd streak for singles and look for color metric changes to make sure they have the clone, they'd often get back not only the large insert that they were looking for, they would get back also small, the, so essentially what looked like vector alone. And you know, this has happened to all of us and we think, oh, we didn't streak for singles enough, we didn't colony purify. But anyways, I think that got him thinking. And so that was one of the observations, like how even after picking for single colonies, how am I getting two things back? So the it's either I'm, I'm constantly isolating things that are close together, or there's a mosaic colony that's generated from a clone that has both plasmids in it. And at the same time, he'd been developing these very bright fluorescent proteins because he wanted to make sure his confocal microscope was working and he wasn't getting bleed through. And so he reasoned if he could get really high expression in single cells, he could see, or in single bacterial cells, he could make sure that the red channel wasn't bleeding into the green channel, et cetera. So he had these tools and he wanted to test it. So he used these bright fluorescent fusions, ceruleanin, B12, 
Venus and M. cherry and calcium chloride E. coli cells. And when he mixed these three together in one transformation, he would get con- uh, colonies that at low resolution looked like they were expressing all three <laughs> sometimes of hmm. these sorry, fluorescent proteins, like Michael said, which are all about the same size and they're on essentially the same plasmid at the same time. And when they kind of zoom in and you can see this in figure two, you get these beautiful mixed colonies that look like this marbleized paper. They're spectacular. I hope Dr. Feinstein puts them up, pictures of these things up in his office. <laughs> um, so mm-hmm. that really, I think, suggested like, hey, we can get these colonies and it looks like their single cells are expressing lots of things. He did a super clever experiment to show this. He used split DFP. So split DFP is a green fluorescent protein that only fluoresces when you have the two halves of it expressed at the same time. And so he used split GFP in a co-transformation. So plasmids that have one half and plasmids that have the one another half, you mix them together, you add them to these calcium chloride competent cells that can take up DNA. And he saw these fractal colonies and that in these fractal, in these beautiful sort of marbleized fractal-ish colonies, he saw that it's only a subset of cells, but that a subset of cells were fluorescing green, which confirms that both mm. halves of GFP plasmids expressing those are in the same cell. And they find it's actually really common that this co-transformation is really common in calcium chloride competent cells, and it's DNA concentration dependent. So at three nanograms of DNA with a mix of equal parts of a teal fluorescent protein, M. venus, which is yellow, and M. cherry, 20% about of those transformants were not clonal. They had at least two of those in there. And that was also amazing. They also see it with electroporation, which is a different method for making cells competent, where you essentially wash them with very distilled water. Um, But you need more DNA to see it. They see a higher rate of co-transformation in the electroporated cells with ice cold cuvettes. I mean, this paper is just full of all these amazing observations. They even do this little experiment to show that calcium chloride transformation depends on association between the plasmid and the bacteria. Hmm. So with these in hand, again, he's like was really intrigued by how you're getting these different plasmids to sort of sit in the same cell. Because again, we're always told only one plasmid will stay in there. But they did this time lapse and you can see it's in figure, one of the later figures in the paper. Sorry. Is it figure four or is it figure five? It's not figure five. Which is gorgeous. Um, I think it's figure four. <laughs> figure five is actually the PS de resistance of pictures Amazing. because you can see the single cells in there. In any case, one of the figures, you can see the single cells becoming a colony. And it is amazing because you see one cell that's expressing all three, and then you see a few of them more together. And again, in this sort of a regular, slightly elongated shape, and then they slowly become a round colony. And that's really exciting. Oh, it's figure seven, actually, that you can see the colony develop. And that's really exciting because that colony is clearly not developing in these concentric circles at all. And if you actually flip back from figure seven, where you can see the colony develop, into f- to figure six, where you can clearly see concentric circles, you can see that the fluorescent proteins are not being expressed uniformly in those circles. Hmm. They're almost segmented. And that, again, says that although the colonies form this concentric phenotype, that phenotype does not actually come out of growth. It probably comes out of later crosstalk between the cells in the, on the outside of the colony and on the inside of the colony. There's just so much beautiful work in here and just so many amazing things that come out. I can't do it justice in the snippet, but I do want to really emphasize that this paper, again, it's not coming from a microbiologist because we have sort of been, I think- Dogmatized. 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 <laughs> yes, dogmatized uh, with this idea about colonies being clonal. And there's no reason, actually, in retrospect, to think that, you know, there these, some of these plasmids have 50 copies in these cells. And there's no, the only reason those plasmids are maintained is because we maintain selection on them. Mm-hmm. It's, 
And why, if you have 50 M Venus in there, why can't you have 25 copies of the M Venus one and 25 copies of the M Terry one in the same cell? There's no reason that they can't be together. So just thinking about it. Um, one of the things that they point out early on is that if you make comp cells, you want to have a high competence rate. And usually one nanogram of DNA, supercoiled DNA, should result in 10 to the 6 colonies if you have if you made good calcium chloride competent cells. But it's been known for a long time, if you increase the concentration of DNA, you don't get you know more colonies. If you go 10 nanograms of DNA, you don't get 10 to the seventh colonies. And that's probably saying that there's a limit in your comp cell population of actually how many cells are mm. actually able to take up DNA and that adding more DNA doesn't do anything. But what's probably happening is that once cells are competent, they can take up more than one piece of DNA. It's not like a comp cell only takes up one plasmid. It could take up two or three plasmids. Mm. And this is true, actually, in the bacillus subtilis field. We use this as a trick. It's called congression because when you make bacillus is naturally competent. So if you essentially give it the right conditions, it expresses protein on its surface that can bind DNA and take it in. And so for congression, you can give it a copy, two copies of DNA, one you can select for using a drug marker and say another that you can't select for, but you can screen for by phenotype. Maybe Mm. it doesn't form spores. And at a one in a hundred to two in a hundred frequency, if you select for the drug marker, you'll get your second marker because really what you're selecting for is competent cells. And so I thought that was also really, really Mm. cool. And they even end with, at the end, by proposing strategies for doing mosaic analysis of E. coli (laughs) mutants. So, you know, in eukaryote, Mm -hmm. this mosaic analysis is a way to see, you know, our cells, is it a cell autonomous or cell not autonomous phenotype? And for colonies, colonies of bacteria, you can use this kind of strategy, knowing that you can get two things in the same cell or single cells. You can use that to do mosaic analysis Mm. in cell intrinsic uh, versus not cell intrinsic phenotypes in this strategy. And again, it was like bonus experiment after bonus experiment. Um, I do want to say that, you know, again, Dr. Feinstein's a neuroscientist doing (laughs) microbiology. And, um, but again, he did this, it grew out of other work that Jackie Bubnell, who's on the paper, has worked on other studies with him looking at neurodevelopment, but um, she also worked on this one, and she found that icing cuvettes before electroporation increases co-transformation in that method. Hmm. The first author, uh, Delia Tomiaga, was fascinated by Jackie's work, and she wanted to do time lapse, so she actually did these 12-hour time lapse that are in there where you can see the single cells becoming colonies, which again, just totally blows my mind because that's not how I thought colonies developed. That's not what I was told. Um, (laughs) And then had a high school student from Hunter High School, which is my aunt and my grandma Helen's um, (laughs) alma mater. Anyway, so this high school student from Hunter uh, was using super folder. He was using super folder GFP to look at translation, which is another study that's going on in the Feinstein lab. But When Dr. Feinstein saw the paper describing split DFP, he had Liam actually do those experiments, which really shows the co-transformation. So overall, this is a fantastic paper. It's beautifully written. I'm 100% using it when I teach intro micro in the spring. It's just great. Highly recommend. Will you change anything that you do with E. coli based on this? Will we change anything we do with E. coli? I think when cloning we're going to streak and streak. We always streak twice, which should help Mm -hmm. because we do colony PCR. If we do colony PCR right with an inside and outside primer, we should be able to uh, get a better... Actually, we'd have to use two outside primers and an inside primer and able to determine if those colonies are mosaic. So maybe I'll have my lab also throw in the second outside primer. To make sure. So primers outside where the insert is so that you insert and then one inside to make sure you have insert. Well, we don't do this anymore, but when we used to, we would grow inserts of seven to eight KB in in plasmids and and they were viral genomes, right? So sometimes, and they do encode proteases, which are toxic and they can be kicked out or now I worry that you would get mutants in mixed colony and and but I'm not 
doing this anymore, so I'm not worrying about it. But if I were, I'd worry about it. I think the way to avoid it is to, well, in addition to being careful and check your clone, your supposed clones, is to use less DNA because Mm -hmm. essentially frequency is pretty low at lower concentrations of DNA. It's only when you go higher concentration, which actually is the tendency that we all do when we're really trying to get a clone, is we really push the amount up. Um, But again, it's really getting a clone is more the efficiency of your ligation reaction and making sure you don't get backbone in that reaction together with the confident cells. So just increasing DNA doesn't really help that much. So maybe it should make us all better microbiologists. And and some people just buy their competent cells rather than making them. Yes. And, and And the commercial competent cells often offer a greater efficiency. Mm -hmm. And that's simply because they use rubidium instead of calcium. It's rubidium Mm -hmm. chloride that the super duper competent cells are used to make competent rather than calcium. So are they though, the question is, are the cells more competent? Like, can you be, if you're going to take up and bind DNA, are you better able to bind the DNA or is a higher and, frequency? You know, I was having a nervous breakdown. More confident. <laughs> I was having a nervous breakdown as I was reading this, thinking about the rubidium and the higher efficiencies of the rubidium chloride transformations and whether or not it, the, because rubidium is a, a different metal, if you will, and whether or not that's changing the electrostatic interaction between the DNA and the outer membrane of E. coli mm-hmm. that facilitates the uptake. So I think, you know, some of these commercial competent cells that use rubidium, they may be able to do this experiment in and see if they get different mosaic patterns. But, you know, this is reminiscent. My PhD mentor, Walt Kanetska, was big into stained glass and This looks like some of these mosaics are these beautiful stained glass images and that you would see with swirling different colors of molten glass. These images are just incredible, but it really drives home what's actually going on. You know, you have plasmids of the same compatibility group, so they're not going to get kicked out because of different incompatibility groups. Hmm. And you have markers of similar size. But when you take it to the next level of putting in genes that do something where you want to put in a copy of A and a copy of B, similar to what he did with the split GFP, Mm -hmm. that argues that the split, because I don't believe GFP is split down the middle perfectly. Mm -hmm. I think it's based on domains. So that really shows that even when you split things where you require protein-protein interaction in order to get activity, you can select for this mosaicism. And this is, I think, going to be phenomenally a powerful technique to do gene function studies to because you can put the same plasmid into the cell and then you can ask the question, okay, how are they interacting? So it's going to have a lot of applications in in pathogenic studies, I think. Oh, yeah. And I think in in pathogenesis for sure. And I think this just opens up a whole bunch of experiments that you can do for intracellular complementation. You could select for the same thing. You Mm -hmm. know, you could select for that. Like do these two things essentially work together in some way, which is also something I never considered doing, but no reason you can't. You you now have the roadmap of how to do it. You select for the same antibiotic marker and it, you ask the question, are the proteins interacting with one another to confer a specific phenotype? Exactly. To the host. Maybe it's I mean, a new it's, kind of back to hybrid. Yeah, <laughs> so, it's a new two hybrid. Yeah, which is exciting. It's, it's worth pointing out that in eukaryotic cells, co-transformation is the rule, mm-hmm. right? So- it was found out long ago, Axel and his colleagues, if you put two DNAs into eukaryotic cells, you have to prepare them very similar to what you do here to make them competent to take up DNA. But if you put two plasmids in, they will both get into most cells, which is really interesting. And so you can take a plasmid encoding a protein and a plasmid encoding a, a selectable marker and select, and you will get 
colonies that are drug resistant and making your protein. Same cell. It, it, so it's yeah. really different in that sense because that's what we actually want <laughs> in eukaryotic cells, right? Get well, I think we could want this. We just didn't know we could do yeah, it. Yeah, you could really? do it, yeah. We didn't know enough to want it. Now well, we want if it. you just want to grow up a pure yeah. plasmid, right, you don't necessarily you want don't it. You don't care. You don't care. I mean, that was the whole boon of recombinant DNA. You could grow up a single plasmid and make a protein or whatever. So, uh, But as you said, Petra, you can make it work in your favor. I mean, you said something interesting. You you played out your transformants, pick colonies and streak them out. We never did that because we would lose our inserts. So we just pick the colony, grow up a small culture and do a mini prep. This, this was before PCR. <laughs> yes. <laughs> mini preps. And we'd find, you know, depending on the answer, maybe one out of 12 would be have it. And that's it. We would go with that. But now I worry that maybe it was a mutant in some way. Right. So. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I was always taught to double colony purify. So. Yeah. For, for stable inserts, it's fine. Yeah. I was taught that as well. And I was working on. um a mutant project in which we used oligos to do um, deletions. And the bacteria didn't like the fact that we were messing with its regulatory genes. And it would go back in. So we would have these cloned into M13, which is a glorified plasmid. And then it would go into the chromosome and pick the good gene and swap it into Mm -hmm. the M13 clone. So I I discovered this like 30 years ago, and I just thought it was an annoyance. But, I mean, this opened my eyes tremendously. So I think the folks out there, this will give you much to think about as you're designing your experiments. It's funny, Petra, you say you were taught, you know, to do twice. Yeah. So, of course, in virology, we were taught to do triple plaque purification, right? No question. (laughs) But no I was, I because I was taught by virologists. But when it came to E. coli, I was taught by virologists who were using it as a tool. So they never told me to do the right thing, right? They just said, just pick a colony. <laughs> I know. Well, that's what microbiologists are always like a little nervous around non and bacteriologists around non Yeah, yeah, sure. But sure. Yes. I do want to add with the epilogue, which is that of the three people who worked on it, Delia Tomiaga is in her last year of graduate school at uh, Will Cornell Med School and is writing her PhD. Jackie Boomnell finished her PhD uh, at Cornell and is currently a postdoc. And Liam Herndon did his undergrad after finishing high school at Hunter at, at MIT and is now working on his PhD at Stanford. So I think this is a great project for all of them. Nice. Very good. Great, great paper. Thanks, Petra. All right, Michael, now it's your turn. Well, in, in keeping with the OMG, the overwhelming microbial greatness, uh, we're going to discuss <laughs> this paper. This is a Mark Martin expression that he's given us. And I think, you know, the last figures from the previous paper are truly OMG. You you just marvel at the colors and the mosaicism that you can see. This paper is from MBio. It's entitled Bacterial Membrane Vesicles as a Novel Strategy for Extrusion of Antimicrobial Bismuth drug in Helicobacter pylori. And the authors are Kumar, Schmidt, Gorget, Marbudi, Magali Duchateau, uh, J. Janto, Mantando, uh, Geigner, and DeRus. And they are all at the Pasteur Institute in various departments. Now, all listeners are likely aware that bacterial resistance to antimicrobials is an increasingly major threat to human health. And some might recall that I've been investigating the use of metals to help control the concentrations of microbes in the built-in clinical environment to help keep these, you know, nasty things under control. Well, in this manuscript, the authors are investigating the effects of the exposure of this stomach pathogen, Helicobacter pylori, to this post-transition and weekly radioactive metal, bismuth, in combination with antibiotics and a proton pump inhibitor to eliminate helicobacter from stomachs of those individuals who are infected. Now, bismuth is not your traditional element, a metal, I should say, in that it's in group 15 
of the periodic table. And it's one of those nictogens, which for those of you who have forgotten your high school chemistry, are any of those chemical elements in group 15 of the periodic table, which I fondly remember as the nitrogen group or the nitrogen family. And bismuth shares chemical properties resembling its lighter group 15 siblings, arsenic and antimony. And immediately above uh, arsenic in the periodic table is, of course, phosphorus. And, you know, arsenic and phosphorus have a long colored history. You just have to read uh, some of the stuff about arsenic swapping out for phosphate in, in DNA. That's, a, that's another twim that we did. We had Rosie on, right? Yeah, we did have Rosie on. <laughs> so th- this is along the same lines, and we're going to see some weird stuff going on here. Now, so as background, Helicobacter is great at colonizing the very acidic environment of our stomachs through the expression of one of its principal virulence factors, namely a urease that effectively raises the local pH so that the microbe can continue to pump protons out, thereby making its living. However, it also has another virulence factor, the CAG-A gene, that when left unchecked, the microbe can go from colonization to gastritis all the way to gastric cancer, which happens to kill 800,000 individuals on an annual basis. Now, the mechanism of how this metal, bismuth, works in controlling helicobacter is not well understood, but this thing has been used empirically for well over 100 years to control stomach upset, for hygienic use, and for sanitation during cholera infections. Now, the active agent is bismuth subsalicylate, which was, again, a drug that was first approved by the FDA in 1939. And today, we recognize it for its main use to control nausea, diarrhea, and gastrointestinal upset in the form of Pepto-Bismol. And, you know, we use sublethal doses of this all the time just to, you know, alleviate stomach upset. I had no idea. And none? This is a revelation to me. (laughs) Well, you know, if you go to Mexico or you go to a foreign country where you're going to be subject to bad water, um, they suggest you actually prophylactically take Pepto-Bismol to coat your gut so that you don't have traveler's diarrhea. And the CDC even recommends that on their traveler's uh, webpage, but that's a digression. So the question that the authors explored is where I believe we're going to employ, again, one of Mark's catchphrases, overwhelmingly microbial greatness, where we observe now how helicobacter can respond to exposure to this potentially toxic metal, which, spoiler alert, the exposure to the metal results in the induction of the formation of these homogeneously sized membrane vesicles that just literally bleb off this gram negative. Carry Each of these blebs carry a unique protein cargo content that is now enriched in bismuth. And so the proteins in there are bismuth binding proteins, which they demonstrated to us by, and they use a wide variety of techniques in this paper. This is a technique rich paper um, by quantitative proteomics. Now, if you can imagine this, the cells produce molecules or proteins to vacuum up all the toxic metal. It's shuffled in on the nickel transporter system. Nickel is an essential trace element that's involved in many redox balancing enzymes. And we just had a long discussion about redox a few episodes ago. So you all know the importance of redox. And so before the bismuth can do any mischief, the cell tosses the toxic waste out of the cell as these membrane encased blebs at no disaster to itself. But then the authors are going to report to us another behavior, 
Recall that bismuth is in the nitrogen group of elements. And like its brothers up the table, arsenic, it can mess with the structure and the fidelity of DNA helices. So upon exposure to bismuth, helicobacter was also observed to induce the production of intracellular polyphosphate granules that are associated with chromosomal compaction. Now, um, poor bacteria lack histones, so they don't get all the joys that the eukaryotes do of, you know, protecting their DNA. But they do can they can do it with these polyphosphate granules. And so, upon exposure to this toxic bismuth, they compact their chromosome with these polyphosphate granules. So. That's basically the story we're going to navigate through. So today on TWIM, we're going to let you in on how this group from the Pasteur Institute deciphered the puzzle of how helicobacter deals with the toxic metal bismuth. And in fact, if you jump to figure six, because this is an open access paper, you get a sense of where we're going to be going. And then as you read the manuscript, you'll really be remarking, as Mark often says, OMG. Because figure six really shows what happens with and without bismuth. And with bismuth, you protect the chromosome through the polyphosphate interaction. So they haven't equivocally shown that. They show it condenses. And then you throw bismuth over the side in this, for better or worse, homogeneous population of membrane vesicles. Stemming from all of this is several metals are known to efficiently kill bacteria, including most of our pathogens. And in fact, I already told you I work on copper. Copper is, again, the champ at inactivating uh, bacteria, and it does it via a variety of mechanisms. Now, the authors offer as their common hypothesis for taking us down these multiple well-thought-out experimental rabbit holes that metal-based therapies in combination with antibiotics or alone might be used to treat bacterial infections. And in fact, that's effectively where the standard of care in treating helicobacter is. Uh, For many years, we just used uh, an antibiotic and a proton pump inhibitor, and it's now morphed into um, not only bismuth, but a proton pump inhibitor and then two antibiotics. And the two antibiotics that are used are no longer colithromycin, but rather tetracycline and metronidazole. And uh, here the authors study the action of the metal bismuth, which again has been used since antiquity to treat these gastric disorders and is in many countries available as the over-the-counter drug in two forms, the the Danol, which is a colloidal bismuth substrate, and then as we can buy it over-the-counter here in the U.S., Pepto-Bismol, which is the bismuth subsalicylate. So again, as I told you, uh, in the U.S., we are using a combo therapy to treat helicobacter pylori infections for people who have um, ulcers and to actually try to decolonize them from ha- holding on to the helicobacter so that they don't transition to uh, the gastric uh, carcinoma, which is principally an adenocarcinoma that um, uh, can, uh, you know, kills 800,000 people. Now, most individuals thinking about microbiology can likely guess what we now know. Strains of this microbe are becoming increasingly refractory to empiric therapeutic strategies. And I already told you that we used to use colithromycin because of its acid tolerance, so it would do well in the stomach, but then the microbes became, helicobacter specifically, became resistant to colithromycin, and now we're cheating and using two drugs plus the proton pump inhibitor as well as um, the bismuth. And um, bismuth therapy is effective even against 
metronidazole resistance strain. So again, we're effectively treating them, if you will, with three drugs now, the metal and the two antibiotics. Now, the metal, as I told you earlier, gets into the cell via the nickel transporter system, where the bismuth simply competes for nickel. And nickel being a a relatively rare transition element in our diets, uh, you can imagine that if you take it, it will compete quite well and the cells will uh, take it up. But here's where we transition from the background on the metal uh, metabolism to the hypothesis generating component of their paper. They offered that very few articles that have been published well over 20 years ago analyze the consequence of bismuth exposure uh, in relationship to H. pylori morphology and its cellular integrity. But what they found is that cells, when exposed to bismuth, would form these dark electron-dense particles And they were attributed to bismuth accumulation, but no one ever bothered to validate it was actually bismuth. Uh, So these several questions remained open, and that's where they're going to take us down our first rabbit hole. So they first determined the sublethal amounts of bismuth that they needed to use so that they wouldn't kill the cell, but they would actually watch it uh, accumulate. And as I said, this this paper includes a wide variety of techniques. They analyze the bacterial response to bismuth mm-hmm. using electron microscopy, both SEM and TEM. They also used mass spectrometry-based proteomics. They used inductively coupled plasma optical admission spectroscopy, or ICP-OES, They use atomic spectroscopy, which enables you to figure out the elemental composition of something. And then they use something really neat, chromosomal conformational capture, or a technique called HI-C, with a little bit of microbial genetics tossed in for good measure. And the the results generated from these approaches revealed that H. pylori has developed quite a novel protective strategy in its response to bismuth exposure. So their data support that H. pylori extrudes bismuth by membrane vesicles. But the defined nature of the bismuth-induced electron patches that they discovered inside the cell actually turn out to be polyphosphate granules that are associated with DNA compaction. So their first experiment, as I said, they determined the sublethal dose of bismuth, which was two and a half micromolar, or about 0.17 times the minimal inhibitory concentration uh, for helicobacter under in vitro conditions when growing microaerophilically in the lab. The membrane vesicles of the bismuth-treated cells, and again, here we're going to use scanning EM, you can see the blebs quite clearly on their EMs. And when they expose the cell to 2.5 micromolar uh, bismuth, they witness the emergence of these round surface-attached membrane vesicles. It's what quite remarkable in the figure, and it's so easily visible in their scanning EMs. They further then characterize these membrane vesicles by purifying the soluble membrane vesicles from the plus and minus, from cultures exposed or not exposed to bismuth. And the first thing you need to appreciate is that membrane vesicle purification yields particles per mil of culture and that they're similar under two conditions. And recall that vesicle formation is a normal behavior of most gram-negative bacteria growing in a complex environment. So this is normal for helicobacter. It normally makes membrane vesicles that bleb off. And earlier when Vincent and I were talking during the pre-show, we were 
sort of guessing, why does the cell do this? And if you think about it, the cell is trying to live in an environment in which it's being fed, and it's got to dispose of this excess energy. And the easiest way to do it is to convert it into cell mass. But cell division takes a lot of effort, and it takes a lot of energy. And so you're probably just teetering on the amount of energy you can safely hold on to, but you still have to burn that energy. And so what they do is they just bleb off some of the cell. And I said to Vincent, wouldn't it be nice if we could just bleb off pieces of ourselves to lose weight? But yeah, no, again, they're, they're very good at this blebbing. They also, some bacteria use it to deliver toxins. Oh, yes. Why does it if you starve it? Sometimes it will do it. Yeah, it's a, it's a very sophisticated yet un, not well understood behavior. Exactly. I don't even know if it's that sophisticated, but it seems to be a very important stress response that we don't study that well. Yes. They they further characterize the vesicles by transmission electron microscopy. Again, that's where you section the cells. And here they section the cells and what they appreciated is that the untreated samples exhibited a slightly wider size distribution of these membrane vesicles that they argue are a bit more heterogeneous in their size with ranges going from 20 all the way up to 240 nanometers. While in contrast, the membrane vesicles purified from the bismuth-treated samples displayed a slightly more homogeneous size. Uh, approximately 40 to 200 nanometers, where with about 85% of them being in a diameter of between 60 and 140 nanometers. And they, they have a lot of pictures that you can go and look at and, and see that what they're telling you is indeed true. Okay, so now they knew something about the membrane vesicles. But why the difference in heterogeneous size distribution ap absent the bismuth? And why more homogeneously membrane vesicles with the bismuth? So they then next asked whether the shift towards a more homogeneous size distribution of bismuth-exposed H. pylori was accompanied by differential protein cargo content. So here they conducted a global quantitative proteonomic analysis. And this was done to carry out the membrane vesicle populations to ask what proteins are in these vesicles. And what they found is that the membrane vesicles had about 486 different proteins in them, <laughs> which represented 32% of the reference proteomic strain of the strain that they were using to compare to 455 proteins in membrane vesicles from untreated bacteria. So there's 32 more mm -hmm. proteins exclusively in the membrane vesicles. So what the hell is going on? So, they then looked at these proteins because this is a proteomic analysis and several were uh, previously identified as bismuth binding H. pylori proteins. So the membrane vesicles have these H. pylori binding proteins, if you will, a giant sponge to mop up the toxic metal before it can do any bad things to what the cell normally needs to do, and that's divide. They found that the bismuth was concentrated in the me membrane vesicles, and they did this by inductively coupled plasma optical emission spectroscopy. Now, the ICP-OES led them to offer that the membrane vesicles enabled the cell to escape bismuth-related toxicity by packaging the bismuth into these membrane vesicles and then throwing them over the side into the extracellular environment. So you're getting rid of your toxic waste and you're sending it to somebody else's backyard. In fact, the membrane vesicles released from H. pylori exposed to bismuth accumulate bismuth 
and that no bismuth was detected in the bacterial cells. They also asked what's going on in the cell while the cell was making these bismuth vesicles to toss over the side. And again, here's where TEM comes into play. They're taking 60 nanometer thin slices and staining them with uranyl acetate and lead citrate, and they're trying to figure out what's actually going on. And the reason they use the uranyl acetate and lead citrate is the membrane remains intact. So you still have intact cells. And what they learned is that the bismuth exposure induces the formation of electron-dense patches. Remember, uranyl acetate is not very sophisticated in figuring out what these things are. You only know it's electron-dense because it appears bright under the EM. And so here, upon exposure to the sublethal concentration of bismuth in a seven-hour experiment, they saw the formations of this electron-dense region in the cytoplasm. And when they analyzed the composition of these electron-dense areas, again, using TEM and energy X-ray, energy dispersive X-ray analysis, a technique that allows you to determine what the metal, what the element is, not the metal, but what the element is. They learned that the electron dense region was indicative of a strong accumulation of phosphorus, which, cutting to the chase, allowed them to offer that bismuth induced the accumulation of more than ten orthophosphate molecules under a high-energy polymetric matrix, which then they offered is, again, another general stress response. So we're getting a lot to what bacteria normally do when under stress. And this is a general stress response, namely the orthophosphate. They polymerize this phosphate. And this has been shown to occur in response to anaerobic environments, and nutrition, nutritional stress. Remember, helicobacter is a microaerophile, and it's got to pump protons for a living. And if it gets too acidic in our stomachs, then it can't pump any protons, and it goes into anaerobiasis, and it undergoes stress, and it's really a, a, a train wreck. So the poly P granules are polymerized by the activity of an enzyme called polyphosphate kinase that they abbreviate PPK. And this is encoded by the PPK gene, which was previously characterized in this microbe. They then tested whether the electron-dense regions induced by bismuth correspond to poly P granules. So here's a little genetics tossed in. They construct an H. pylori PPK deletion mutant. And then because it's one of these genes that you can't get rid of, so they complemented it um, with a delta, the delta PPK strain with an active copy of PPK at its native locus. And again, using the thin section approach, plus and minus exposure to bismuth, they again demonstrated that bismuth exposure in concert with the PPK deletion, prevented the appearance of phosphorus-rich electron-dense regions, which was recovered in the complemented strain. So the response of PPK to bismuth and its requirement for proper cell segregation is what they address in their next set of experiments. And here, They are arguing for proper cell segregation and the role of this metal in the induction of the poly P granules to promote, if you will, the nucleoid reorganization. Again, using a wide variety of sophisticated techniques, including high C, which can help them develop an understanding of the chromatin structure, if you will, of the bacterium. They confirmed that the bismuth induced clear alterations of the nucleoid organization, especially in its compaction. So putting this all together takes you back to figure six, which briefly they have presented, namely, you observe multi-level effects 
resulting from a simple sublethal exposure of bismuth on the H. pylori physiology, implying protection and defense mechanisms. Now, they offered that since blood plasma concentrations of bismuth, which is the traditional accepted proxy for the gastric concentration that the helicobacter are going to see, are often in the sublethal range for H. pylori, their study offers us the first framework analysis of the effects of how at least a gram-negative pathogen might protect itself against bismuth exposure, where the toxic metal is simply bundled up and then blebbed or tossed over the side in a behavior in which 32 proteins are upregulated, though they still have to show that, but they show that there's 32 unique proteins that are able to bind bismuth. And then as a consequence of exposure to the metal, we see complex alterations through the action of PPX and the chromosomal condensation. So we discover a novel defense mechanism that H. pylori is uh, using to escape bismuth toxicity. Now, they found that when H. pylori is exposed to sublethal bismuth concentration, uh, again, the, the size distribution is remarkable in that it's relatively homogeneous uh, in these membrane vesicles. And these membrane-bound vesicles increased as a consequence of being exposed to the bismuth. So one remarkable finding of, of this study is that the membrane vesicles released may suggest alternative strategies we might use to treating other gram-negative infections that have somehow figured out how to get over antibiotics or get over metal exposure and really give us a handle on, you know, trying to figure out how to coexist with bacteria in this ever-increasing antimicrobial-resistant world we seem to be living in. Michael, what's the, what do you think is the sensor for bismuth? What starts all this? I don't know. It, it may be a function of it interacting with nickel and it's a stress response. I think it's one of the stressor responses um, because bismuth has no real utility in the cell. Mm. Um, and I don't know what it's actually seen, but the concentration I think is driving it. Maybe they could make a mutant that doesn't respond to bismuth and find out, right? <laughs> I mean, do you think this is going to be a generic response? Like if you put some other metals in there that maybe aren't, that are in this category of not great, but not lethal. You might well, identify more Well, you know, antimony is, you know, similar. We use antimony as an antimicrobial, albeit for uh, parasites. Mm. And so antimony is used, but it's very hard to distribute. And the CDC is the only agency that distributes antimony antimicrobials for parasitic infections principally to treat leishmania. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you start throwing metals at bacteria, if they're going to do this, like E. coli. Well, you know, this is a bizarre metal. It's one of these basic metals yeah. because it's all the way over on the other side of the periodic table. It's well away from the transition elements. But I, I don't know. It's You know, metals fascinate me of, <laughs> of how we bring in transition elements I mean, the other interesting, and I did my PhD research on selenium, which is another mm -hmm. schizophrenic pseudo element, pseudo metal. And it, I think it all boils down to redox. I still remember fondly the question they asked me at my qualifying exam of how a Xerox machine works, since the active component is selenium in a Xerox machine. Mm. And I can still explain it because I learned, but um, this was a, a fascinating story. And, you know, when I th saw the membrane vesicles blebbing off, I said, this is one clever behavior. And then by virtue of the fact that bismuth could 
technically interfere and compete with phosphorus. You know, it's in the same category as phosphate. But whether or not bismuth becomes, you know, the equivalent of a phosphate molecule, I don't, I don't know. I, enough I would think it would cause so many problems if it did. Yeah, like you would think it would be like carbon monoxide and oxygen. You, yeah, yeah. So, how much bismuth is in the environment? I mean, Helicobacter, it lives in your stomach. Where else does it live? It lives in acid environments, and it has the urease as its behavior. I don't know where. The other niches, helicobacter, any of the acid-rich environments. And in fact, I put into the show notes, you know, they talk about the human having an extremely acidic uh, stomach. And, you know, we're, we are, the acidity in our stomach is very similar to other carrion eating uh, scavengers. Mm. You know, we're talking vultures and, you know, yeah, people, yeah. because you know, when, before we, you know, figured out how to use tools, we had to gather and we were principally eating off of carcasses killed by the top apex predators. But what I'm wondering is where would, where would Helicobacter encounter bismuth? I mean, this response exists, unless as Petra said, it's a general response to metals, right? But it must exist to be a benefit wherever the natural niche is. Do you, do you have bismuth in your stomach? If you're not, not if you're taking Typically, it. No, no, yeah, not, if, not if you're not taking it. I mean, the bismuth, I looked up because I was curious how much in Pepto-Bismol, the chewables have 260 milligrams in them of bismuth. Wow. But I don't know the pharmacokinetics, like how much of that actually stays in your stomach. Hmm. So it seems to be quite a bit though. Um, and, and using Rich Condic's favorite tool, Google, bismuth is mainly produced as a byproduct from lead and copper smelting. And so, so my, yeah. my guess is that we were likely exposed very early in our evolution as we began to make tools hmm. uh, in the lead and copper smelting as we began to make metal tools. Because, I mean, the, the, these experiments were done at sublethal concentration, right? And yes. they say, you know, the bacteria get rid of all the bismuth, but if you put too much in, they die. So there's they die. So what? So what is the concentration that they're using it at? That was actually a two and a half micromolar, two and a half, or which is point one seven, um, the MIC. Okay, so there's a they're going to basically be over the MIC then for if you take under pep- under no no if you take Pepto Bismol. I'm just trying well, to no, the concentration in your stomach because the stomach empties. Yeah, empties is going to be very low. Okay. It's going to be low. And that's why they picked the concentration of two and a half micromolar because when you take Pepto Bismol chronically, you get a, a blood level or a plasma level of this concentration. Gotcha. So that's why they picked it. Gotcha. I'm just trying to figure out where <laughs> this myth is. Yeah, I mean it's bacterium because apparently it's only in the stomach of org- of of hosts and yes. So why does it have a bismuth mechanism? Unless, as we have already said, it's not a bismuth mechanism, but it's a general metal mechanism, which would make more sense to me if if it doesn't encounter bismuth. You know, you guys know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, yes. exactly. I mean, my feeling is it's probably some because I mean the bacteria make these vesicles all the. You know, there's some low all the time, yeah, and they're all the time as a stress response. So I'm guessing that this, you know, it's whatever for whatever reason they can be sensitive to different ones, and yeah, just this response. But yeah, okay, that makes sense. So uh, maybe they should try other metals, Michael, and see if you get the same vesicle same same effect, same vesicle activity. But you know, it's been used, and it's it's probably. It's generally recognized as safe by the FDA because it's been yeah. used for so long. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, you know, we've been using it for, you know, since the 1400s when it was discovered as a stomach remedy. Yeah. And, it, yeah, yeah. and it's only found in small quantities on the Earth's crust, but, you know, we've been using it and... I think the other thing is it goes into solution better when ammonia is around. And as helicobacter right. produces a urease, it produces ammonia as its byproduct, which raises the local pH, which may keep it in solution 
better than in the acid environment of, of our stomachs. So helicobacter is one weird bug. I mean, it changes its um, outer membrane proteins. They're similar to Lewis antigens on our blood grouping. Hmm. So it's able to hide in our, on our mucosal surfaces. So it's, it's really a pretty clever bug. All right. Thank you, Michael. Very interesting. That's that's uh, twim two seven five show notes microbe dot tv slash twim. If you have a question, a comment, twim at microbe dot tv. If you enjoy what we do, consider supporting us. Microbe dot tv slash contribute. Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. Petra Levins at Washington University in St. Louis. Thanks, Petra. Thank you, guys. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.